So it's been a little while since I posted anything on this channel, but there's good reasons for that. Obviously, I think the background gives it away a bit. This channel was called Kurt Studio. It used to be called something else, but then it was renamed because it was kind of created way too far in advance. It was obviously supposed to be a video for my studio environment whenever that came around, and now here it is. So that means that things are probably going to change a little bit on this channel. So today we're going to talk about what this studio is, why it exists, what the point of it is, what I'm planning to do with it, and hopefully what you can expect going forward. And this also affects the main channel as well, quite obviously, because this is where everything happens and also this is a massive work in progress at the moment like we moved in a few weeks ago i think i've lost track of time and there's just stuff everywhere i didn't realize how much equipment i had built up over the years that has now been taken out of storage and what i'm doing now is i'm going through phases of expansion and compression as i call it which is where when you unpack everything the junk you have kind of like expands to fill the space and then you have to compress it into a more efficient layout and then as you add more tools to the space it expands again so you have to compress it again and i just think that's like a natural part of the creative process especially for like you know setting up workflow environments and stuff like that so I don't think I will show people the space properly until, sorry, let me just adjust the microphone volume because I'm still getting this all set up. I don't think I'll show people on the main channel this properly until I've gone through a few more cycles of expansion and contraction to the point where on the surface it visually looks sensible. Just look at this little junk mess over here. This is just like random stuff I want access to while I'm working on the computer. But it looks like a landfill at the moment. And you know, cables everywhere and all that, but you know, that's the necessity of it. That's functionality. The robot's not even plugged in at the moment. I've got to tighten up the screen on the base hang on where's my hand there we go there there's some like um, nuts i need to tighten up underneath and there's the computer system i need to boot up and see if that's still running fine being this hefty thing but we can talk more about that another time anyway so the story is that i didn't really pay for all of this in fact it doesn't really belong to me kind of so this house is a place that we have a family have moved to it's in a way you can think about it as my parents retirement home me and my brother still live with our parents because you know what the housing market's like nowadays but the thing is when we were living back in london we had a much smaller house and i was given the smallest room in said small house because i was the second one born so my brother got the bigger bedroom i got the smaller one which turned out to be inconvenient because i ended up being the one that you know does everything and I have a ton of equipment so it just would not fit into a 2.5 by 2.5 meter room which needed to include you know my bed the wardrobes storing all my clothes etc so everything was pretty much run out of that one bedroom for years and then we started the idea of moving house like going a bit further out from London to get a bigger space for the family. But even that took kind of like years to manifest and finally find a place. And then even after we found the place, this one took like another, I don't know, couple of years of waiting for things like even technical reasons where like, sure, how long we had to wait for our builders before they were free to do the work. But also if the house is unoccupied for a certain amount of time, then the VAT you have to pay on building prices is like lower. So there's always like overlapping elements. It took so much time and waiting, but we moved down to the area early by going to a rental property. And then we needed to extend the time on that but even when that ran out we needed another property to kind of rent out to finally make it to a point where we could move in here and like live even though they're still working on the house so it's been this really long and drawn out process so the agreement was because i had the smallest room back in london for so long to the detriment of my work and the channel and all that then i would be allowed to design a space in the new house how i saw fit with all the lights and all the power and the data and the desks going around the perimeter and all of that and that i would be able to use it even though you know it belongs to my parents although they'll be ours for inheritance. And also if I ever stopped using the space, it would still be useful for my dad in the future who doesn't run a business from home, but he does have a lot of equipment as well. So that's the kind of basic idea behind it. It's like a joint project of mutual benefit. So I would go to every single meeting with the architects, with the builders, with the quantity surveyor all along the line. And I was consulted for how I want this space to be. And I think it turned out pretty perfect. So I'm happy that I was involved in that process. And obviously every way throughout the line, someone would go, oh, I think we could use some of the space in the studio to do this or do this. And I had to put my foot down a bit as much as I could because we did have a viable space back in London in the form of like a garage building that could have been turned into a home studio but the problem is a lot of us in the whole family are hoarders I like to see myself as a slightly different type of hoarder more of like a resourceful hoarder where I like to see how everything could then be turned into something that could make money a bit entrepreneurial if you like for example I do keep some like packaging material to recycle into artwork and I'll show more of that in the future it's not that I just want to keep junk so I want to give recycled material a new purpose and that way I don't see it necessarily as just hoarding but more as resourceful hoarding with the intent to sell it on as artwork on like a store whether it's my site or an Etsy 
Nazi or something like that. So we did have this garage building back in London, but it became full of my dad's paperwork and other just random bits and bobs. My dad works in the film industry, so there's a lot of uh, scripts, invoicing, contracts, random props, pieces from the workshop and stuff like that. So it was just unusable. So I put my foot down with this one and I said, okay, this space in here will not be used for random storage because we seen in the past as a family, if we use a place of storage, it will never be used for anything else. There was a little bit of a concession with that because a corner of the room got taken away to be used as a storage room, <laughs> which is annoying, but also useful because it also helps um, as like a functional ducting space. There's like extractors in the house and they kind of they go up through the ceiling there along and then took a unit in the storage room. So it basically kind of hides necessary things, but that was the compromise. Let me just get this camera back. So now the million dollar question is, what am I going to do with the space? But obviously most people know me for the digital work, the YouTube channel, the Blender resources, etc. And this will be useful for that as well. So one example would be because I've spent a lot of time investing into procedural material techniques. If you've watched the latest videos on the main channel, you'll know about that with the hex scatter tool that Chris and I have just released. Part of the idea for making that going forward was to sell materials materials made using samples from real life sources. So here with this lighting, with this space, I can do a proper, maybe not so much a photogrammetry setup, but that will, that will also be a thing, but just a good space to physically, photographically sample surfaces from different objects of which I have a collection of ready to go. But also I would like to go a little bit deep with that where I want to build my own microscope. This is just a stock one. I want to make my own and then attach it to the robot arm. And you can set pivot points on the Kuka arms to then get creative with sampling around a point like around an object. So that'll be another project. That's just one tiny example of a digital use case, but I want to lean more into physical artwork as well, not in spite of the digital work, but on the side of it. It's something I find quite fun. And, you know, I kind of indicated that on the main channel at one point where I was trying to learn about shipping. I showed that I do a bunch of doodles and I sold a couple of them to some audience members, which was quite fun. I want to do more of that, but for a purposeful reason and also experiment with making unique handmade pieces of merchandise, whether it's for the Blender community or not. But I just like the idea of getting hands on with stuff. I want to do more sculpture type things. And again, all of that can be recycled for digital work as well. If I do a real life sculpture, sell it somewhere, whether it's for my audience or again, like on an Etsy store, I can photogrammetry that in, reuse it for digital artwork or even sell it as digital resource. So there's always like these overlapping elements where there's just so many possibilities. Let me show you something as well. I'm not like, I mean, I'm a 3D artist, but I do like random 2D things as well. Let's see what else we got here. We got like starting to use recycled packaging material as bases. So what I call bases are like art pieces that aren't done. They're just like um, platforms to then do artwork on. So this is made using notes uh, written while working on the YouTube channel. Among other things, I have boxes and boxes full of old notebooks and stuff. So old art bases made with like random doodles and stuff. So again, artwork is done over the top of this and then this itself becomes merchandise. And something I alluded to as well is with this whole idea of resourcefully recycling things. This itself, even before it's made into an art piece, can be reused for digital resources in the way that once it's scanned in, which I've done for quite a few of these, this can itself be recycled as a material input source. And I've shown experiments where I've done this, where I've combined my procedural metal work with modular metals with these things, art bases. So I'm obsessed with these ideas of how physical work, which intrinsically has value of its own, albeit of a different kind, can be reused in the digital space. So there are slightly more advanced ones of these. Again, these are just bases. So these are things which would be ready to sell when I finally gain the confidence to actually put stuff on the store again. We have random doodles made in acrylic frames, which are hand drilled. So these are just sweet, subtle little things like that, like little pieces of merchandise people can have, which I can provide a stand for as well. Or I was thinking about maybe designing one with like little notes in the back. So if people wanted them, they could have them. Then aside from that, we have slightly more complex collages with the doodles and stuff. So again, we've got like note bases here with more structural pattern type things. Again, not everyone's kind of thing, but what I figured was I'm just doing all of these doodles anyway, just because I can't turn my brain off from doing that while I'm working at the computer. So again, resourceful hoarding is keeping all your doodles, slapping them together. Maybe it becomes valuable for someone else. But there's quite a few of these now. So here's another one. And I quite like the idea of someone maybe having it just somewhere as like a reminder that just let your creativity fly. You know, a lot of people, they feel shame or something about just working on whatever they want to because they feel like everything needs to have a purpose in getting them a job or making them rich. Or if they're not doing the thing that someone else is doing, then that's going to be a detriment to their life. But I quite like these as just reminders of just just, just let it fly. Like experimentation is where cultural value comes from. So there's more and more and more of these. I think that's one of my favorites because I quite like there being quite a few dark elements in them. This one in particular has got like some shiny gold bits to it. So, oh, actually I like this one as well. 
So these are just like the starting ideas for things. And again, all of this is attention deficit type artwork. Like I said, there are more usual like concepty type things, but I found that I'm more interested in doing structural geometric things with 2D art. I don't know how to describe that. It's like I get my dose of raw complexity and I can go as far as I like using 3D with Blender. But when I come to doing 2D and say if you're doing like characters or environments or something, I just can't help but think oh, if I just did this in 3D, I would have so much more power, like not in how to make it look good, but just in if I draw a wall in 3D, I can see that wall from every single angle. And that's compelling to me. Like I haven't found how to make that compelling for me with 2D yet. But with things with just like geometric structures, how can I codify feeling into basic form? That's something I feel like I can get from 2D that I don't feel like I get so much for 3D. I mean, you could do it with 3D, sure, just like scatter random things with geometry nodes, but that just, it feels different. I feel like basic form overlaps quite interestingly with like a sense of value you get from, like a physical artifact, a piece of paper. Like something I've been quite inspired by in the past is the Cosmati pavement at Westminster Abbey. It seems like quite an obscure historical thing to be inspired by, but I like that because it tells a story about like the, uh, the length of the universe and just kind of life itself. Like sure, we can create creatures and cool looking architectural buildings and make the wildest vision effects and go as far as we like with that, pushing billions of vertices in 3D, but on paper, in physical space, codifying complex things into simple geometry is what I find compelling. And a lot of people look at that and they go, oh, that's just basic stuff. You know, we were doing that in school, just doodling on paper. But again, that's what I find interesting. It's like the more meaning you condense into the smallest thing, the more valuable that thing becomes. It's like uh, watches, for example. A watch is just a single, relatively small object, but the more money and man hours and effort and the more valuable the resources that go into it, the more valuable this small thing becomes. So I see 2D artwork as not just, oh, it has to look good. I see it as an opportunity to condense value into a small space and really I think that is the art of it. Speaking about hoarding notes and stuff I did say I've got years worth of notebooks that I can use to sample for these art bases and such so I am not limited on resources in this way but I feel like to have the confidence to do more physical stuff aside from all the digital I can't just go posting it on the main channel so I've been thinking about ways to organize alternative channels to kind of display that with more confidence to explore the physical artist side without feeling like it's in conflict with the other side and that's partly why in the studio space things are separated digital over there physical over here and in the space in between we can find ways to sample them and link them together such as with the ideas for the resources that I mentioned. But the space goes further than that. So right now you are sitting in medical corner or lab corner, because obviously medical problems have become quite a thing for me. If you feel like watch my video speaking about that on the main channel. So I just needed a space to help me do and keep track of things. So I won't show you this, but I've got a box over there that I call my survival box, which basically has like a collection of different medications. There's a lock box over there where I've got more medication and I've started getting things ready to get a bit more complex with uh, supplements in the way that I feel like I need a very particular combination of minerals and vitamins to stay stable. And this isn't like some kind of weird health voodoo thing where it's like, oh, you need to get your thiamine or your magnesium if you want to look young and stable. It's not quite like that. Some of my issues have very obvious and very real consequences if I skip out on things. In particular, if I've been active and I'm losing electrolytes, it will trigger a BPBV episode where the otoconia in your inner ear detach and float around the canals. For like a couple of years now of repeated testing, that proves true. And caffeine, especially in the form of something like this, so why are you drinking it, um, exasperates that. If I just drink caffeine and I don't reintroduce minerals for the form of electrolyte supplement drinks or coconut water, which is a good natural alternative, which has made a difference from my measurements, then that will trigger new episodes. So I need to be careful with that because the loss of electrolytes also reduces my threshold for vestibular migraine, which in my case are triggered by signal mismatches between the neural circuit dizziness and the mechanical signals of the inner ear. They're not caused by uh, blood vessel dilation or anything like that, as far as I can tell. It's a neural messaging signal issue. And I know that because when I've had BPPV episodes and when there's a sudden kick of the crystal uh, sometimes my brain resolves that quite quickly and other times it can't resolve it and then that triggers the migraine and i know that i had an episode recently where i forgot to well, i didn't forget i just didn't take my magnesium supplements for three days beforehand and the migraine was pretty much the upper limit of how bad they get lasting for 48 hours um, after about 12 hours of laying in bed i could then get up and start walking around still with nausea it's become apparent to me now that not taking magnesium is a very bad thing when i'm at, at a like risk point for having one of these vestibular things and to clarify a migraine is not a headache the headache is one possible symptom of a migraine and i don't get headaches with my migraines you can think about it more in this case as like an epileptic fit of the neural vestibular system where your brain hallucinates balance signals and a very easy way to tell whether it's neural circuit or actually mechanical is to run a few tests so for example 
if you do have BPPV and there's a crystal floating around here, if you move your head in a certain way, BPPV, by the way, stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, meaning if you change your position, this is going to cause vertigo. Uh, during a migraine, because it's a neural hallucination, no matter where you move your head, the signal is going to stay the same. So if my eye is drifting right during a migraine, and then I flip my head upside down or I flick it to the left, it's still going to go right relative to my position, which means it's not positional. That's very different to a BPPV episode where a crystal is moving and that gives you vertigo because then when you do change your head, that signal and your experience is going to change. So my eyes may drift right in one direction, but then drift left in another direction. And there are other ways to kind of tell that as well. You got like jerk tests you can do and you see how quickly your eyes regain targets and stuff like that. And you can then infer that you may have vestibular neuronitis based on how difficult it is to like regain your target. And there are lots of different like micro tests like that you can do. And I could talk about that for hours, but the point is there are common elements in all of this. We want to raise the threshold of migraine and we want to reduce the frequency of BPPV. And the way to do that is to supplement minerals for me, which minerals I just go for a shotgun approach. But the two most important ones that I found are magnesium and potassium. Of course, you need to be careful with potassium. I don't take that in a regular supplement form. Again, coconut water, that one bananas. When it comes to slightly more dangerous things like potassium. I always say the approach that nature knows best. Nature is quite homogenous. We can extract things from it which are useful, you know, like vitamin D, quite important one to have around, which is also quite important for BPPV, but I've never had a problem with that. But for slightly more dangerous things, I think balance is essential and we don't necessarily know how nature has balanced things, but it tends to find a way. It's kind of like how I was watching Clarkson's farm and they made an interesting point about how um, exploitation of the farming fields has led to a lot of problems, like the crops can't survive on their own necessarily. And we struggle to try and keep up with like resupplementing the fields with important nutrients and nitrogen. But an interesting thing to note is that despite how difficult it is to keep the fields running, the hedgerows between the fields that aren't farmed seem to do fine on their own, just in nature. They still produce things like berries and all sorts of other things. And even when the fields are dying, the hedgerows are thriving. Of course, there's going to be caveats there, but it's just interesting to note that nature homogenizes and it responds to all these different environmental variables. But we can come along and do something useful, which kind of twists it in a certain way. But we don't consider all the variables. We don't just do it naturally. We're kind of selectively paying attention to certain variables like our crop output and then using that as the target, the metric. We need to widen our variable scope to keep things healthy. All of that is to say that for certain things, I like a more natural approach. And for other things, I like a more, should we say, a forceful manufactured approach. So riboflavin, if I have days where my uh, neural vestibular issues, which are PPPD, which is persistent and postural perceptual dizziness. It's basically maladaptation side effects after a phase of vestibular trauma. Trauma just meaning anything that's gone wrong. Um, for some reason, riboflavin helps to suppress some of those neural maladaptation symptoms. Now, an example of a maladaptation symptom would be if I'm just sitting at a computer and if like if someone wobbles the desk slightly, then my head may spin out and I may trigger a migraine because again, it's a signal mismatch. Or if I'm sitting down and I've got one foot sideways, where can you see that? One foot sideways and then I rest another foot on top of it, then my head may spin out again and you know it's a neural issue rather than a mechanical one because the signal is very fast onset and then fast offset if you move away. Mechanical inner ear signals for me are very different in the way that they're they can be fast onset but they tend to be slow onset and then I stand up and I try and like recalibrate but that doesn't help because the crystal's moving and then you're slowly progressively getting worse and worse. So as you can tell these are things I think about quite a lot and I would like to do videos specifically about them for people that have issues or for like medical researchers that may want some info from a test subject who has very specific conditions. For example, I have posterior canal dehiscence, which is, again, this, make, this is what makes me more prone to these issues than other people. One of the things around your inner ear canals, you're kind of tightly packed in your skull. Then you've got like this middle cranial fossa, and there's a space between where you have a layer of bone it kind of wraps around where the inner ear is. But for some people, that layer of bone can be either really thin or can be perforated in the way that the bone hasn't actually fully formed over it. What that does is it gives another avenue for vibration to enter your inner ear. And this is why people with this condition and hear things like their eyes blinking or their heart beating or other internal sounds more than other people. And I think I have some issues with that, not so much with the auditory things, but I do have pulsatile tinnitus in one ear that I think might be related. I might need to get that checked out in more detail. But the thing is, it also means that like loud sounds, like a dog barking in my ear, 
Thanks, Parker. Introduces a sudden vibrational wave that comes in through another angle and can like knock crystals, as far as I know. At least that's what I felt. It also means that there's a general slight increase of a background noise compared to someone that doesn't have the condition. And I believe this has led to my brain relying slightly less on the inner ear and more on other senses to maintain a sense of balance. So proprioceptive, body position and visual, which is I think why the maladaptation symptoms appear and why I don't have response to the Dick's Hall Pack maneuver, just in case any vestibular people were watching. It's a little bit like space adaptation syndrome. When people go to space, their brain is suddenly met with a bunch of, you might want to call it like white noise from the inner ear because you're in a microgravity environment so you're just getting like noise signals so your brain kind of dampens its reliance on that over time which is why you see astronauts who can do like maneuvers like spinning around and around and around and not feeling dizzy it's really interesting so basically you can imagine that if you think about that as a target like astronaut level and a regular human i think i'm just here like just a little bit up the chain in that process just as a natural baseline i've always thought it would be interesting for me to go to space and see if it would be faster for me to adapt compared to a regular person so nasa spacex if you're watching i'm up for a test although i don't recommend perforating astronauts skulls to help with that process uh, a lot of unwanted side effects would occur Anyway, massive tangent, but I feel like that's the point of this channel anyway. Sometimes I want to talk about things that I find interesting, can't do it on the main channel. Kurt Studio is going to be the place for all of this. Let me just talk about stuff freely. Let me experiment, let me do projects. We're going to cover all different subjects. And maybe I'll try and do something to make that clear, like on the thumbnails. Maybe I'll get like a little medical symbol when we talk about medical things, like a physical art symbol when we do physical art. As for like podcasty things, I don't know whether I'll do that on this channel or a separate one because there's been a bit of a demand for that and I would love to get back to it because podcasting with Blender Creator is good therapy it's like it's like free therapy effectively i now have the capacity to live stream again because the internet here is really good i've got like ethernet data ports around all of the walls we're on like a gig internet so i think i managed to get like 900 and something megabits a second with that computer back there which came from an nvidia sponsorship a while back october 2021 crazy how time flies it was like just yesterday i did that i also want to build a render farm in here if i can because i've got like computers to recycle where my thumb is there's some computers wrapped up in bubble wrap there's another one down there as well it'd be a good chance to test flamenco from a uh, cyprin for the blender group i need to kind of think about uh, network assisted storage although i don't like the idea of things being accessible over the internet so I might do some kind of local thing i've got like other recording setups to get working with oh god there's lots to do all right stick around and hopefully i will see you soon